everybody. I'm Dr. Rick Hansen, and this is The Loving Brain, uh, Real Skills for Real Issues. And in this series, I'm joined today with Dr. Paul Zak, uh, who I'll talk about in a moment. But just overall, I want to welcome people to this program, uh, encourage you to share it with others if that's what you'd like to do, and certainly use it for yourself uh, to help yourself become more loving and more centered and, and more effective in lots of different ways. Uh, today I'm extremely happy uh, to have with me someone that I've been very interested in and have read closely, uh, Dr. Paul Zak. Uh, he's a preeminent uh, scholar and practitioner in the field of what's called neuroeconomics. Uh, he perhaps uh, and arguably coined the term itself actually, and he runs one of the main programs in the country for doctoral students in neuroeconomics. Uh, his book, which just came out last year, uh, got a great deal of attention for good reason, called The Moral Molecule. The Source of Love and Prosperity, uh, was a finalist for the Wellcome uh, Trust Book Prize. Uh, he's the founding director of the Center for Neuroeconomic Studies and professor of economics, psychology, and management at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, Dr. Zach also serves as professor of neurology at Loma Linda University Medical Center. He has degrees in mathematics and economics, uh, a PhD in economics, and he's done postdoctoral training at Harvard. Uh, he's been in the vanguard, really, in the investigation of how uh, neurochemical processes in the brain, notably with oxytocin, the molecule that he's most uh, known for, um, have to do with relationships and uh, economics and financial decisions and making choices about costs and benefits and how we allocate research, resources. rather. Um, He's also done very interesting work in extending the notion of oxytocin and other social processes in the brain to thinking about civilization broadly and what we can do to make the world a better place in the 21st century. Uh, he's a regular TED speaker. He's been on Good Morning America, Dr. Phil, uh, Fox and Friends, ABC Evening News, NPR, a bunch of other things as well, I'm sure, and his work's been covered by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other top-tier magazines. So, oh, and I should mention as well, his popular blog, The Moral Molecule, is featured on Psychology Today and has a dedicated following. So, welcome, Paul. Very pleased that you're here with us. Thank you, Rick. What a great introduction. Oh, thank you. Well, as people may be amused to see, you know, behind me is the converted laundry room of my home, which is my office. Behind Paul, he's in an office right now in a hospital, I think, in Las Vegas, a university setting there. He's in scrubs because he's right in the middle, actually, of running an experiment, correct? I am. Yeah. And what you see behind him is a sheet uh, that's been moved to cover the fairly frightening and scary uh, painting that was behind him, which we thought was just at odds with uh, this program here. So that's what you're saying. We're very resourceful here, right, in science. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, let me just dive right in, if I could, then. Uh, I'll ask you a question, then I start out by asking everybody, basically, which is, why has it been important to you personally to get better at relationships? You know, relationships are the foundation for living a satisfied life. And, you know, much of the work we do combines neuroscience and positive psychology. And it's very difficult to read that literature and not think, gee, this is something I should be better at. Hmm. And honestly, Rick, I'm an introvert, and so I like to spend a lot of time by myself. I'm not shy, but um, I don't work very hard at relationships, or I didn't work very hard at them. So there's a saying in psychology that all research is me-search. Hmm. So perhaps I got into this field of social behavior and social relationships uh, because I was trying to improve my own social relationships. And I think I have done that, actually. I've followed you know, what my research has shown and other people has shown to improve the quality of my relationships. Yeah, thank you. Well, if you don't mind saying, and maybe use shyness if you like, which I think is an underrated factor, actually, often in the lives of many people, uh, how have you worked with that yourself, including how have you perhaps applied some of what you've learned intellectually to this personal issue that, of course, is quite emotional and interpersonal? It's a great question. I mean, a couple things. One is really training myself to make eye contact. Mm -hmm. And so particularly when you're a busy person, you know, we, we're looking down, we're looking at some electronic device, um, or we might not uh, look at the person we're talking to. Yeah. So I think, you know, one simple piece of advice for people watching is to listen with your eyes. Mm. And so if you listen with your eyes, you're giving that person their full attention, your full attention, yeah. and you're going to pick up on all these cues that you wouldn't get if your eyes are dashing around and you're looking here and there and not making eye contact. Obviously, if I'm staring at you like a, you know, that's very aggressive, but make eye contact, look away, 
but really try to make yourself present and give that gift of presence to the person in front of you. So I think that's one take home. When I started doing that, by the way, in my lab, I have about 30 people in my lab, everyone really got a lot happier because now when I was talking to them, because I'm really busy, so I don't get as much time with every individual as I'd like, they really felt much more respected. They felt much more cared for. And I would pick up on their emotions. I'd say, oh, you know, Rick, you look great today. What, you know, you're, looks like you're having a great day. And we'd have that wonderful little conversation that wasn't about work. It was just about being a human being. Mm. Certainly my wife and my kids, I think, are happier too. Ah, great. Thank you. And it's great to have the little very practical yet profound thing of making eye contact. Um, maybe that's a bit of a segue to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, which has to do with um, how we evolved a social brain. In other words, how uh, in the lives of our ancestors, maybe starting even with mammalian ancestors, loosely 200 million or so years ago, which is quite remarkable to appreciate, you know, how long we've been uh, a social species. Um, and then obviously moving through primates or hominids and early humans. You know, how um, did becoming better at relationships, broadly defined, how did that confer reproductive advantages on our ancestors so that they could survive better and pass on more genes? So that progressively, if you could just kind of walk us through this and lay something of a foundation here, so that progressively social capabilities and inclinations toward things like love became actually woven into human DNA. Could you kind of give us an overview there? Sure. So through the course of evolution, um, a number of neurochemicals started to evolve, starting out in fish that be, appeared in mammals. And you know, the hallmark of mammals is, of course, live birth and care for offspring. Um, but throughout most of the mammalian history, um, most animals lived in quite small groups. And uh, those groups would be more or less kin-based groups. So you might bring in, so to avoid inbreeding, for example, chimpanzees, male chimpanzees will leave the troop around six years old. They go to a new troop, and they have to try to fit in, and it, it's a very aggressive kind of situation. And so you know, they get beat up a lot, and, and they sure earn your way in to be uh, in that troop. Uh, but humans are, I think, very unique in that we not only tolerate being around strangers, we, in fact, enjoy it. So it's fun to be in a big city. It's fun to interact with new people, meet new people at a party uh, most of the time. Right. Um, so there's evidence that as humans evolved, as we became, we became more social, our brains got larger. But we also developed a much larger mass in the front of the brain for receptors for this neurochemical you mentioned, oxytocin, which we study a lot. And so these frontal brain oxytocin receptors actually make it feel good to socialize. So now we have this really interesting you know, little mutant that has got into the mammalian mm -hmm. species for humans. Uh, versus other mammals, in which now socializing is not a, such a scary thing. We essentially have a, a safety detector or a trust or familiar, familiarity detector in our head. So I say, oh, that's Rick. Rick has never scratched me or kicked me or bit me, so I'll release this neurochemical and then affiliate with him. And once you have that, you set up this feedback loop in which it's quite valuable, in fact, to interact with others. I might meet friends or people I can work with or trade stuff with or romantic partners. And so... Through this long course of evolution, we've become not only social mammals, but what I call gregariously social mammals. That is, we really like to interact with the other humans, and we wouldn't do that unless there was this feedback loop. And so we've worked for about 10 years running laboratory experiments to understand how this social connection system leads to positive social behaviors. Um, we would call those moral or virtuous behaviors like generosity, compassion, trustworthiness, kindness. So why would you ever be kind to a stranger? Ever. Well, lots of different views, for, for example, in economics would say, hey, that's just bogus, right? The only reason you would interact with a stranger is because there must be some kind of get, way to get resources, take some money from him or her. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most of the other disciplines realize that there's actually value alone in relationships. And I think one of the unique things about human beings is that we can extract value from relationships with strangers. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we have to have something in our head that says, this person seems okay and safe to be around, and this person doesn't. Mm. So if we didn't have that very rough, simple indicator in the brain, we wouldn't be able to live in civilizations where we're living and working around strangers all the time. And so oxytocin seems to play an important role in that identification of someone who's safe. So oxytocin modulates the kind of trust-distrust, approach-withdrawal, safety-fear continuum that we're living on when we're mm. moving around the sea of strangers in which we live. 
That's very interesting. It's kind of like an internal detector of friend or foe, as it were, and like the needle keeps moving. Um, if you could also speak to uh, the ways in which uh, there are other social systems, if you will, in the brain uh, that work alongside oxytocin, uh, empathy circuits, uh, theory of mind capacities. If you could just talk about that a little bit, that would also lay a nice neurological foundation for what we're doing here. Great. So um, what we found in these 10 plus years of experiments is that uh, when someone receives or interacts with another human being in a positive way, so you receive a positive social signal, yeah. for almost any one of those we've looked at, including movie clips, um, trusting someone with your money, uh, being touched in an appropriate way, the, the brain of the recipient will release oxytocin, and that motivates reciprocal behaviors, so like with like. So you're nice to me, I'm going to be nice to you. That's essentially the golden rule. So we're finding these underlying neurochemical bases for the golden rule, which exists in every culture on the planet. Excuse me. So what oxytocin does is when it's released within about a second of a stimulus, and it activates, as I said, these receptors in the front of the brain and a couple ones near the brain stem, and it modulates this kind of fear, trust continuum. And it does that by um, modulating the release of essentially reward chemicals in the brain through this feedback circuit. And those include dopamine and another chemical, serotonin, which, as you know, is associated with mood. So you basically get a mood lift and a little reward when you're with someone and they're nice back to you. And so we're setting up this feedback loop. And so I think one of the beautiful things for the work you're doing is that we essentially, when we are loved, we can't be more loving. That is, mm -hmm. there's a feedback loop in there. And indeed, our work and the work of uh, those who work with animals, our work with humans and animal work suggests that if you don't have a lot of nurturing and care early in life, that this care, nurturing, love, affiliation, empathy circuit starts to break down. Mm -hmm. And as adults, individuals may not have uh, the capacity or as, as much capacity to love others because they haven't experienced love. And so the, the reason for that is that your brain is the most expensive real estate in the body. And if brain circuits aren't being utilized for the purpose that they're sort of originally designed, then uh, they redeploy to help that organism survive and reproduce mm -hmm. in some other way. Yeah. So, um, so the brain's stingy. And so um, to cap that off, you know, you can't induce your own brain to release oxytocin, or it's actually very difficult. You cannot induce your own brain your what own again? Brain release oxytocin. You can only give that gift to others. So it's just like love. You can't force someone to love you, but you can love other people. And often, if they return that love, then you have this nice reciprocal feedback loop going on. And so we see that in our studies of oxytocin, that this is part of that foundation for care, nurturing, love, and empathy. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That's a lot of stuff I put into the... That was good. It was so great. Back. One, or tell me well, you got the blue scrubs on, so you get to do that. It's okay. <laughs> um, well, let me recap if I could a little bit. So we have this 200 million year journey, you know, 6 million years since our last common ancestor with chimpanzees, right? Uh, two and a half million years of stone tool manufacturing ancestors with brains a third our size. And so as the brain evolved on this long run, you're saying that it really helped our ancestors to be able to read friend versus foe and to be able to increasingly modulate their response to strangers, find ways to establish some kind of basic connection with strangers, and then, as you well know, um, you know, develop parent-child bonding, maternal-infant bonding, that's the beginnings of oxytocin right there, and then mate bonding, friendship bonding, and then ultimately the village it takes to raise a child supported through networks or links, if you will, um, woven together in part through this amazing little neurotransmitter, this little molecule in our brain and its various transmitter and receptor systems, right? Right. And then we have these very interesting things that happen that when we receive oxytocin stimulating experiences, if you will, or si stimuli or, or signals, that's also rewarding. You spoke about dopamine and it's also uh, soothing or mood supporting and therefore you also spoke about serotonin and then you said a very interesting thing at the end that I wanted to follow up on which is you said that in effect uh, oxytocin is really a gift in other words we can enable others to have an experience of a rich sense of being cared for and comfortable with other people so that we can lower our, do our guard we don't need to bear our fangs as it were and we can get along with them but we cannot self-stimulate it. 
That was very interesting. And I wondered about that because, of course, uh, many people uh, have experienced that they can deliberately activate certainly an internalized experience of being cared about or included. Like I can think about all kinds of things, my wife, my kids, my friends, our cat. As soon as I do that, I can think about teachers, spiritual teachers. Uh, people ask about this too, who I feel loved by. I can, in other words, I can self-activate the experience of love on the range of it, if you will, from being included or seen at one end all the way through being liked and appreciated and even cherished and loved. So to what extent is it possible, especially people who are grappling with wounds and maybe don't have people in their life who could give them that experience, but at least they can do something for themselves, you know, in terms of self-generating important self-nurturing experiences such as self-compassion. What do you think about that? That's a great question. So again, this sort of oxytocin research field in terms of this behavioral effects is only about 10 years old. And, um, and as you know, you know we, we've uh, shared this information. When I sort of first started thinking about this as a modulator of social interactions with humans, one of my colleagues told me it was the world's stupidest idea uh, because it was just known to be associated with birth and breastfeeding. And, um, this being oxytocin. This yeah. being oxytocin. So, so the, the honest answer is we don't really know from a neurochemical perspective when someone meditates, when someone prays, when someone uh, reflects on the experience of being loved. Uh, Thinks that, about their grandmother and the smell but, of those oatmeal raisin cookies. So there's, there's some evidence that we've got coming out on recent research looking at different forms of meditation and prayer. And we have found that uh, both alone and in groups, um, meditation and prayer do induce the release of oxytocin in a majority of people, not in everybody. Mm. Um, we've done this also in churches. Uh, I was in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea two years ago, uh, looking at indigenous peoples and their uh, rituals. Um, but as a punchline, we found that among the most powerful uh, kind of self-stimulus for oxytocin release is a form of meditation called loving-kindness meditation mm. or metta meditation. Yeah. And it's a kind of meditation that you know very well in which you focus on loving people not only close to you but far from you and even complete strangers. Um, and so we find oxytocin release but also strong behavioral effects. People were more altruistic when they did this. And we're still analyzing this data, so I don't want to you know, um, uh, claim that something's there until we really have nailed it. We've also done functional brain imaging on these individuals who had never uh, done this kind of meditation before. Mm. We've also found that meditating or praying in a group is an effective way to raise oxytocin. So uh, near me in Claremont, there is a very famous uh, Zen Buddhist monastery called the Mount Baldy Zen Center. Yeah. And um, I was visiting there some years ago. They met these Buddhist monks who were just amazingly present and joyful. Mm. And I said, wow, what's going on here? And so we talked a lot. And um, I asked one of the monks, you know, look, you meditated for tens of thousands of hours. Why do you need to come up here in the mountains and the snow and... He said, because meditation is hard, it requires perseverance and the right setting and also people to do it with. Mm -hmm. And those people are very encouraging. So yeah. um, I think one of the take home research from the take home messages from the research I've done on oxytocin is that we are intensely social creatures mm -hmm. and we need to be embedded in community. And it's mm -hmm. community that gives us both happiness, a positive mood and the opportunity to express moral behaviors. That's a beautiful answer, and I, I respect the fact that this research is preliminary, but that said, in, in this informal context, it's really quite exciting, really, that your findings, uh, whether it's in terms of neuroimaging or, you know, oxytocin levels in the blood or other forms of, you know, estimating brain levels of oxytocin, um, that you're actually finding that it's plausible and there's be preliminary evidence that people can, in fact, do various practices that coincident with an internal experience of becoming more loving or more compassionate or taking joy in the good fortune of others, etc., that in parallel with that, there is apparently a rise in this underlying physical process, these currents of this particular molecule and it, the activation of its you know, related circuits in the brain. Like, that's really, really cool. So I have a question for you now. Uh, most people think about, I mean, traditionally, as you well know, people have thought about oxytocin in terms of, you know, the letdown reflex in breastfeeding, uh, mother-infant uh, bonding, uh, 
Oxytocin, again, as you know, women on average roughly have about seven times as much of it as men do, although we're loving too. But anyway, uh, so oxytocin is usually related to talking about parenting or sexual relationships, you know, lovers who bond, who release oxytocin when they have an orgasm and so forth. Okay. Could you distinguish uh, something of the differences between, let's say, oxytocin-related processes in romantic or parental child relationships from oxytocin processes, say, uh, among friends or strangers at a cocktail party who are starting to like each other, or even people who are in some ways adversarial but are needing to find common ground? Because this you know, if they don't all hang together, they'll be all hung separately, as the founding fathers used to say. So what do you, could you take a crack at that? Oxytocin sure. distinguished in those two different groups? Uh, so let me uh, answer that question by giving you an example of an experiment we did um, at a wedding. So yeah. I went to a wedding and took blood from the bride and the groom and the wedding party and family and friends before and immediately after the vows. I heard about this experiment. Yeah. We a lot of people did. Yeah. So, um, so oxytocin has a very short half-life. So if this, if this is the connection, care, empathy molecule, I don't want to leave that, that switch on, if you will, all the time because I might run into some scary person I need to fight with or get away from. And so yeah. it's a, kind of a quick indicator, but it's not a zero-one indicator. It has degrees of variation. So, for example, in this wedding, the bride is the center of the wedding solar system for sure. She had the largest rise in oxytocin. And then who loves the wedding almost as much as the bride? Her mother, of course, so she's number two, the groom's father, the groom, the family, and the friends. So think of these individuals as sort of a right around the bride like planets around the sun. But the strength of the oxytocin release tells us about the relationship between that person and the wedding party or the ritual itself. So if I were to see a colleague that I like uh, at Claremont, I might release, you know, uh, increase my oxytocin 10%. So based on levels are close to zero, they're highly variable because... Again, your brain's very stingy. I don't make, make oxytocin unless I need it. And when I make it, I'm, you know, I turn it off real fast. So I make it, hey, it's a safety signal. This guy's safe. I can hang around him. Versus if I, say, saw my wife or my children, in which I get a, generally a much bigger release of oxytocin, right? So this sort of you know, tingling on the back of your neck when you see a, a person you're in love with or mm-hmm. your child. And so children are very effective oxytocin releasers, especially little children, because if they don't get our attention and care, they die. Right, so so um, uh, I'm sure you you have kids. You know, new baby smell. So we have a lot of oxytocin receptors in the olfactory bulb, mm-hmm. and that new baby smell is that wonderful smell that says this is a little helpless, sweet little thing uh, that you know most of the time is wonderful to hold and care for and love. And we have this feedback loop that just encourages that. So one reason why human beings have much stronger oxytocin systems, I can tell you technically what that means in a minute. Uh, versus other mammals is that we have these little parasites called children who are attached to us, you know, not only for six years like chimpanzees, but for 18 or 25 or 40, depending on, you know, how long. So my parents are still living. I'm 50 years old, and I still call my parents and tell them when I have good news. Hey, Mom and Dad, guess what happened? You know, Rick interviewed me on Skype. It was so fun. So that power of attachment, as you said earlier, evolve into not just care for offspring, but now I've got to care for them for a long time, and Zoom, now I care about the guy I'm working with, hmm. or my secretary, who I've had for 17 years, who is the most lovely woman, like her husband, like her family, she's just, she's become like a family member. So one way to think about oxytocin is that this molecule that evolved to motivate care for offspring in mammals, in human beings, often makes us treat strangers like family. Hmm. And so we are, we are building community wherever we go because we're building these uh, sort of quasi-families. Mm-hmm. And I think, lastly, one of the really big take-homes from the work uh, that has been in animals, and we have a little evidence now in humans, is that the more you release oxytocin, the easier it is to release it. In other words, the threshold needed to induce release gets lower, and there's this uh, feedback loop in which you get better at loving others. You get better at building relationships. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really exciting. It says that we're not stuck with, you know, this sort of uh, the personality traits we were born with and the, everything stopped evolving in our brains when we were seven. We can actually get better at connecting to others. Yeah. And again, your introvert, number one subject in all experiments, I've become much better at connecting to others around me. And again, I'm an introvert. 
I am very busy and also have high testosterone, which inhibits the release of oxytocin. I'm an athlete, you know. And so having said all those things, I've worked very hard to apply my research to connect better to people around me, and I think I am connecting better. Well, I can attest to that, certainly. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about your previous baseline, but you're connecting great here, obviously. Uh, I wanted to really underline something you just said and then ask you a question that's a follow-up on something else you said. Um, <clears throat> as we know, people can clearly have a brain that can become sensitized to the negative. Uh, people can become increasingly combative and fearful and aggressive and hateful, uh, if you will, anti-oxytocin uh, with other people. If metta is the traditional word for loving kindness in the language of early Buddhism, anti-metta, if you will, is where people can become very easily sensitized to, which makes sense in a sense um, in terms of evolution that it would, it would be good for animals in the wild and early humans who are being routinely oppressed or attacked or, or frightened or uh, who really need to gird their loins and, and attack back uh, to become sensitized to um, anger and aggression. Okay. On the other hand, you're talking about something with this cutting-edge research that's incredibly exciting, that it also looks like we can sensitize the brain to love. We can sensitize our brain and make it increasingly inclined toward responding to people, responding to people rather, in a compassionate, kind, caring, and empathic way, correct? And right. that's very, very hopeful. Uh, in other words, that refers to the underlying material processes that support what we've, many of us have experienced psychologically, that if we do incline ourselves more and more toward caring, we become more caring. But right. what now is starting to come in in preliminary ways is the scientific evidence for the underlying physical processes that support that. And that's great. So people should have hope and confidence that if they do their practices, they will actually be changing their brain for the better. So. I thought it was fantastic that you said that. So then building on something you said a moment ago, you're going to distinguish between human oxytocin systems and those of other animals, especially other mammals, obviously. You were saying there's a important, some important differences there. Do you want to say more about that? Sure, uh, just briefly. Um, so about 3% of mammals will pair bond, in which the males and females live together to raise offspring. If you compare the distribution of oxytocin receptors in those 3%, which includes humans, and the other mammals, which we call promiscuous, the males mate and then disappear. They don't, they're not engaged in uh, caring for offspring. Uh, you see, again, in this frontal cortex, many more oxytocin receptors, bigger density and larger region with oxytocin receptors that, again, modulates this kind of feel-good system. So, um, in, in the 3% that pair bond, that's what you're saying? Pair bond, right. And in, now compared to humans to the other pair bonding animals and humans have again even a larger mass relative to our brain volume. So we're again much different in that we really want to be around the other humans. So as an example, you know, think of how we punish prisoners in jail who misbehave. We put them in solitary confinement. Yeah. Right? It's physiologically and psychologically stressful. People will actually hallucinate very rapidly in solitary confinement because we're just not made to be by ourselves. We don't like it. It's not good for us. And so if you reverse that logic now, what do I need to be happy, healthy? I need to be connected. And I should say that for people who are, as you said, who are uh, suffering, who feel disconnected, we've actually done some small-scale experiments looking at the use of social media. Uh, mm -hmm. So just like we're talking, and we've shown that uh, in about a dozen people we've measured so far, 100% of them release oxytocin when they use social media, not just Skype like we're doing here, but including texting, tweeting, and so from the brain's perspective, it looks like any connection is a good connection. And the more you connect, probably the more you can connect. Yeah, that's great. So now I'm going to ask you, because I've got you here in a good way, um, a little bit of a technical question, but it has very important implications. So as you well know, uh, neurons fire and they release neurotransmitter molecules from their sending tips. That's a very common form of neuronal behavior and transmission. Uh, but many neurons also uh, release uh, in a more ongoing kind of steady state way, less of a phasic firing way, but more of what's called tonic release of neurotransmitter molecules, especially little skinny ones, the peptides like oxytocin, from the cell body or elsewhere in the cell, but in an ongoing way that's kind of released throughout the brain as a whole, which could in principle 
just separate from the activation or deactivation of various circuits, uh, as you say, oxytocin itself is a fairly brief half-life. But if we could for, could, for example, alter the resting state of the brain's fluid in general, or its concentration of oxytocin in certain key regions, like reward centers, you know, in the brain stem or in the basal ganglia, uh, if we could do that, that would be another way to physically, physiologically, increase a person's propensity toward uh, loving kindness or altruism, cooperation, generosity, and so forth. Uh, what do you think about that potential mechanism of sort of lasting foundational change in a person's brain? That's a great question. And again, this area of oxygen research is so new that we haven't uh, really ask that question very well. We, we, meaning the community of people working on this, including both in animals and in humans. Yeah, um, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, there are there's some technical reasons why that's difficult to do. Uh, so just like there's no, I'll sort of give an analogy of why that's the case. Just like there's no blood test for low synaptic serotonin, which is associated with depression, and, although that's up to some debate. But you know, let's accept it for now. Yeah. Um, Serotonin is the major neurotransmitter of your gut, and so 99% of the serotonin in your body is going to be in your gut. And mm -hmm. if I do a blood draw and measure serotonin, it means nothing because... It, so oxytocin is the same way. It's released in body and brain, mm -hmm. and in yeah. brain it's actually hard to measure. So yeah. our lab is working on a number of uh, fairly technical ways to measure the oxytocin in the brain itself. And then mm -hmm. we can actually ask that question, mm -hmm. ask about... Uh, for in vivo, for living people, what's the distribution of their oxytocin receptors? We can look at chronic levels of oxytocin um, as opposed to phasic levels. So there's a number of technical hurdles, and it's it's a technically expensive project to do. So it's something we've been working on for a number of years, but we don't have a great way to do it. Yeah. What we have done is do, done backdoor approaches. So let me tell you about one of those, some new work we have uh, coming out soon. So debut here, first time. Um, and that's looking at different uh, genes for the oxytocin receptor. Mm -hmm. So there are about 200 different versions of the oxytocin receptor gene, and some of those have been associated with, for example, greater empathy, uh, greater sense of connection. And so we did some experiments to look at whether those, and those are based on self-report. So I'm a really empathic person. Yeah. After, in fact, we find people who rate high on survey measures of uh, in personality traits for empathy do release more oxytocin. Uh, for the same stimulus as people who um, you know have, are lower on empathy scales. So we looked at actions. So mm -hmm. although we use self-report, I think actions speak louder than words. Yeah. Because who knows what you say on self-report. You might, you might, so we've right. seen psychopaths, for example. Psychopaths tell me they're really, really nice people on self-report, but you know, they're really not. So, um, okay, uh, what do we find? We find that these particular oxytocin receptor uh, variants that are associated with greater empathy are also associated with more charitable giving outside the lab and in the lab. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, this is mediated through uh, spiritual commitment. So people who are much more religiously active mm -hmm. are the ones who have this variant and volunteer and are more charitable. So it says that we actually, again, need some kind of spiritual community, I think, to be able to sometimes exercise our own predilections to connect to others, to help others. Um, so I think it's a very interesting finding. And, you know, when I've just said that, you said, well, that makes perfect sense. Everybody knew that. Yeah, but now we have this interesting biochemical pathway, which can be turned off and can be turned on. Yeah. Uh, you know, these, these basic genes are there, but of course genes are switching on and off all the time. So I think from the perspective of viewers is to work on activating these mechanisms in your brain um, and because, again, the brain's just into your organism, the more you do something, the more it likes to do something. It, gets, it says, oh, apparently this is what I'm doing now. So um, for this same kind of stimulus, say, interacting with a stranger, I can bias myself towards being uh, more caring, more affiliative, more loving, if you will. Yeah. Thank you. Well, just kind of a quick recap then. It sounds like this mechanism of action that I was talking about, uh, the technical word for the geeks like me in the audience is paracrine, this ongoing release of these tiny little molecules from the body of the cell that's not specific to a momentary activation. Anyway, it could be a plausible underlying mechanism of action for helping a person become ever more loving. 
Uh, more broadly, though, what you're saying is that the more we do it, the more we're inclined in that direction, the more rewarding it feels. So this obviously leads to two questions. Uh, the first is that if you want to get more of the good stuff, one way to do that is to have less of the bad stuff. So what's the bad stuff, as it were, that inhibits oxytocin processes? Great question. And so there's two major ones we found, um, and maybe I'll add a third. So one is, I mentioned already, high levels of testosterone. So Rick, you and I can attest to viewers that the least empathic people on the planet are teenage boys, because we both used to be them. Um, so <laughs> I've raised one, too. Yes, sir, He's cool. very empathic, though, you know, <laughs> and I've known a number of men in heterosexual couples who will say, I'm the chick in the relationship. So, well, you know, okay. Going. So, um, so high testosterone, again, testosterone varies a lot between men, and high testosterone inhibits oxytocin release, and we could tell an evolutionary story on why it's appropriate for young males to be more aggressive in risk-taking. But anyway, as we age, it, it modulates. As our, we're in a committed relationship, our testosterone goes down. When we have children, it goes down. So nature helps us keep these balances. Um, the second, which everyone knows from experience, is high levels of stress. So when I'm stressed out, when you're stressed out, I'm not the nicest person. I grump at people. I'm not as, you know, uh, patient. And so, um, and so we know that. So what do you have to do the next day? You have to go into your spouse, your colleague, and go, hey, Rick, I was a real jerk to you yesterday. I'm sorry. I was having a bad day, and I realized now that I sort of took it out on you, and uh, you know, I hope you'll forgive me. So, again, understanding that if I see someone who's grumping at me, doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. It could be that they're having a bad day, because this stress puts our brains in survival mode. It's all about me getting through the next 10 minutes, yeah. not me reaching out and helping other people. And the last thing I should say, since we're talking about patients, is we've done work on people who have been severely sexually abused, women. Mm -hmm. And uh, as children, they were sexually abused. And um, about half of them don't seem to release oxytocin on stimulus. And they all have very impaired social behaviors, like comorbid depression, uh, and in fact, and we did a lot of work uh, over several years. We imaged their brains and measured their genes and measured oxytocin. And uh, one woman who was 21 actually uh, committed suicide during the waves of our study, uh, very sadly. So, um, you know, abuse, again, doesn't let this brain circuit that helps us connect and feel empathy develop properly. And, um, uh, you know, severe abuse can really inhibit those abilities. We like said that we looked at control uh, samples of college-age women. Turns out about half of women, by the time they finish college, will report having been sexually abused. So the ones in college had, uh, by and large, uh, much less sexual abuse than the these are women who had been, you know, as children raped repeatedly or whatever. Very bad outcomes. And, and all abuse is bad. Let's agree on that. But for uh, less frequent abuse. Um, these women had intact oxytocin system. So it looks like you need a lot of abuse to really shut down this social connection system. But for individuals who may have suffered through abuse or neglect or abandonment, we really don't know how much you can restart this system. So as you know, this basic research has stimulated a lot of clinical trials now of oxytocin replacement therapy for people with social anxiety and depression, and, um, schizophrenia, autism. And so far, those studies show only very mild improvements in some of the social deficits of these disorders. Let me interrupt you, Paul. You're talking, when you say oxytocin replacement therapy, you're talking about uh, pharmacologically, right? Correct. Yeah, just to be clear here, you're not talking about people doing intensive self-compassion practice or something like that. That's right. Yeah. Although, again, that could be an alternative and perhaps even um, you know, parallel things you may be important to do. But I, I don't you know, just practicing oxytocin is going to solve it. Yeah. Um, well, first, obviously, I mean, just it's haunting for me at many levels, including having a daughter who's 22, uh, to just kind of feel the weight of what you're saying. Uh, I do want to come back to the critical question of how do we rehabilitate, let's say, uh, our capacities for oxytocin uh, or related social feelings and behaviors. How do we rehabilitate those if we've been traumatized? Or frankly, how do we rehabilitate them if we're caught up in stress or aggressiveness, you know, high testosterone? Or uh, another one I, I thought you might have been about to say is fear. Uh, I think some people, when they're afraid, they, they want to move very quickly to, into a relationship, but it often comes from a kind of 
needy, desperate, protect me, protect me place, which is understandable, of course. But and I think about the uh, capacity to give love. It's it's hard to give love when we're frightened ourselves. Uh, and yet there's so many things in the world that frighten us and we're very vulnerable to fear. So how do we love through the fear? You know, you know right, the classic line, love is letting go of fear. So maybe you can talk about that. But so actually, let's just do this. How can people uh, help themselves? Uh, sounds like so far there's no magic pill. Uh, it may be around the corner, but not yet. How can people help themselves with both internal mental practices as well as maybe doing what they can uh, in their relationships to nudge them into a better direction. What can people actually do, especially if they've been wounded or even traumatized uh, as children or as adults? It's a great question, and I don't think I have all the answers. I can just take a, a small slice on that. Um, the first is that these brain mechanisms are very evolutionarily old, so they're not generally open to conscious awareness. So the first thing is to be conscious of what you're feeling, mm -hmm. right? And if you feel anxious in a relationship, if you feel fearful, um, what is just to own that emotion first and make sure that you're, you understand it? Um, because again, this stingy brain doesn't go, um, hey, guess what? This person's not very good for you. You just have a kind of a funny feeling. And so you've got to spend some time reflecting and trying to understand that. Mm. And, and that's honestly where, um, you know, someone trained uh, like yourself is important to help people kind of work through those difficulties. Um, the second is to find community. So um, one of the great uh, predictors, perhaps the strongest predictor for resilience against uh, you know, terrible outcomes, you know, abuse, neglect, and abandonment, PTSD, and social support. And so in our sexually abused uh, uh, female sample, those who had social support were much more likely to mm. actually have good life outcomes than people who were more isolated. So, mm. um, so the second thing would be build community around yourself. And that may be joining um, a group of survivors of abuse. It may be joining um, mm. a self-help group. Uh, or it may be, again, using a, a professional therapist to help understand those issues. And the third is to uh, build up rituals that will help you. So yeah. um, we've done a lot of work recently. In fact, we're doing one today, the experiment I'm at here, mm. the role of ritual. And the ritual, ritual is not generally done alone, although sometimes they can be, yeah. uh, for example, meditation, but rituals done uh, in community, and we find that these community rituals accentuate the release of oxytocin and promote these positive social behaviors. And so um, that ritual could be as simple as, um, for a Catholic, I'm going to go to Mass uh, every morning at 8 a.m., and that's part of my morning ritual, is to, uh, to be grateful, to uh, be grateful to a higher power, uh, if I'm a Buddhist, I may want to meditate for, um, you know, 30 minutes when I wake up at 5 30 in the morning and start my day at 6. And every morning, I'm going to do that ritual. It could be something for people who, uh, you know, don't have spiritual beliefs or want to get involved in that. It could be working out. It could be going for a run every morning. Walking in the woods with your Definitely. dog. Definitely. Playing golf. I mean, it could, you know, there could be an important set of rituals that gets you in this mode where I'm doing the same thing every day. It's amazing that when you do these rituals, you will find others who are also doing them. So walking a dog, you know, you inevitably you talk to the other dog owners, right? And um, so I think it's important to have those kind of rituals that help you connect to those around you, but also connect to yourself. Yeah. I'd like to build on what you're saying, and I'll, I'll be quick here, uh, to mention three other things that I've seen actually are really quite helpful for people who are, in a sense, they're, they're reclaiming their own heart which was quite uh, bruised, uh, if not terribly bruised, based on uh, trauma or abuse. Um, one is to just, frankly, again and again and again, try to help yourself, even if it's very brief and very mild, have a moment of experience on the spectrum of feeling cared about. That ranges from just being included, you're part of a group, you're part of a work team, uh, there are people you have lunch with, uh, there are the other people on your, the floor of your apartment building. Uh, you're in, you have a family or if you have some friends, hopefully. Uh, further to people who actually are trying to understand you. They may not be perfect about it, but they're trying to. Uh, they're tuning into you. They see you in some way. Uh, those experiences of feeling seen are profoundly important for us socially. Uh, and also uh, appreciated people who recognize your contribution, uh, that you made a difference, they're, you're, you're respected, uh, and also liked and even loved. So again and again and again, 
taking in the good, as it were, of those 10 seconds worth of experience of feeling cared about in some way, uh, again and again and again, uh, will help build out a slot back on the motherboard, if you will, of the mind-brain system so you can slot into it these experiences of, of feeling cared about. The second thing is, of course, self-compassion. It was terrible what happened to you, whatever it was. And to bring a kind of kindness and, and goodwill to yourself and a wish that you hadn't, it hadn't happened and, you, and a wish that you're not suffering, much as you would bring that wish to bear for a friend. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of research these days on the power of self-compassion. And I think that's extremely healing for people. And then the third thing, I think it's very important, is to appreciate that deep down inside, you're still intact. Deep down inside, as you and I have been talking about, you very eloquently, we, are, we evolved to love and be loved. We know what that's like. That's deep in our bones. That's woven radically throughout the brain and the, and the whole body system. And um, you can have faith, no matter what terrible events happen, that you're not fundamentally, you may be injured, but you're not broken. And you really can rehabilitate your capacity to love and to have faith in that. So, um, and now, I'd also say for viewers, mm -hmm. if you see a person around you who's suffering that way, reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's a great thing. And, and you will get so much you know, feedback and, and happiness from helping that person. Just be a listener. Not to fix anything, but just to listen is That's very great. important. So not only do individuals who may be suffering can do things to help themselves, but you know, yeah. be a little proactive. If you see a friend or a colleague at work, you know, ask them out. Let's go have a coffee and chat sometime. And uh, you'd be surprised how tiny little efforts like that can really change people's lives. Yeah, that's really true. Thank you. Well, speaking of ritual, uh, you've done some very interesting work on story and how storytelling or listening to story, the narrative nature of our relationship life and so forth uh, relates to oxytocin. Could you kind of unpack that and maybe also help us appreciate some of the practical implications of it? That's great. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, uh, we started looking at story first because we uh, had used positive social interactions kind of real time as uh, ways to stimulate the brain to release oxytocin and then to see what the effects are of that. And one of my former graduate students is now a colleague with me, George Barasa, um, had this idea to use a very short and sad video of a father uh, who has his two-year-old son with him, and the son is dying of terminal brain cancer. And in my study of this video, it, it, it reliably induces oxytocin release. We've used it now many, many times. People also report the sense of empathy. So the change in oxytocin makes us feel empathy, and that's how we connect to others, is we start sharing emotions with them. Mm -hmm. So once we studied this little little video, we started kind of breaking down its narrative structure. It has a classic kind of dramatic arc where there's rising tension and then falling tension and a resolution of the crisis in the story. Um, so it began to occur to us that the way that different organizations or cultures transmit their values is through story. And so we began doing more work on stories. And we've used uh, uh, public service ads a lot because public service ads we can get an objective measure on whether that story has reached you because we pay to be in an experiment and we give you a chance to donate money to the charity that's featured. And of course, we really donate the money to the charity. We don't keep it ourselves. We, you know, we're the good behavior guys. It would be bad karma not to send the money along. And indeed, we found that um, effective stories induce the release of oxytocin. And there's a couple other interesting things going on. You have to capture some of the tension first. And anyway, so we've been characterizing these stories and. They have real impact. And again, we're in experiments where we're taking your blood or we're putting a drug up your nose, which is uncomfortable. And people will give away, you know, a lot of the money they've earned for being in these experiments because they're really moved by the story. The drug up the nose is oxytocin. Is oxytocin, right. And so, for example, in the study we published just a couple of weeks ago, we gave individuals oxytocin compared to those who got placebo. Uh, donated about 50% uh, more money to ads than, uh, than the others. And so... Oxytocin really connects us to others, in this case, connects us to the characters in the story. Now, why is that relevant? Because story tells us about purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So purpose is really important for human beings to know why we're here or what we're doing for the next two hours. And so stories are a very effective way to transmit the meaning that some activity has. And so if we want to imbue our lives with meaning, then we need to have a story about it. And so... Um, I'm sure you've done this with your kids, but my kids, 
I always tell them a story. Ask me a question. I always tell them a story around answering that question because I want them to remember it. If I just say 3.27, they don't care. Or, you know, 3.14159, whatever the value of pi is. But I can tell you about the story of the Greeks who discovered pi. And then that story ends up having much more power because they remember not just the numbers, but why it was there, why it's associated with circles, on and on and on. So, um, Anyway, stories are very compelling, and so we are actually currently doing work funded by the U.S. government, your tax dollars at work, um, trying to help the government, uh, in this case the Department of Defense, tell more effective stories, particularly for our allies. How do we get other countries to cooperate with us in, for example, the war against terror or enhancing opportunities for trade or for immigration or for whatever? We need to actually get people to understand the purpose of this, and so we are uh, ongoing. And I should say we've gotten very effective the stories we've, uh, we've analyzed so far to predict whether someone will donate, for example, to charity, we can predict with about 95% accuracy. So mm -hmm. we really have these, these uh, signals, not just oxytocin, but a, a bunch of other things in the brain go on as well. So it's actually really fun because get a baseline on you, let you watch this little story, and then I can predict what you're going to do. Why? Because we know about stories that have purpose. We know about stories that have particular structure and that induce empathy. So what's this mean? Why do we cry at movies? Why are we sad when we finish a long novel? It's because we've transported ourselves into that world. And even though we know cognitively it's a fictional world and these are professional actors on screen, we can't help but put ourselves in other people's shoes. And in fact, we do that in real life too, right? We see someone suffering. We put ourselves in other shoes. And oxytocin is one of the brain chemicals that helps us do that transportation which is an amazing cognitive leap, right? Just, just think how interesting the human brain is, and no other animals do this for sure, in which now all of a sudden I'm experiencing what you're experiencing. So yeah. I was on a plane recently, and I watched the new uh, James Bond movie, and I realized he's on the edge of a big tower. He's going to fall off. My palms are sweating. Yeah. I, I, I'm vicariously involved in the experience that this you know, fake movie, he's not, of course, really falling. He's on a, he's on a green screen somewhere, right? So... Uh, you know, this is an amazing cognitive leap. So I think it gives us insight into human nature. And storytelling is really evolutionarily old, right? That's how we transmit valuable information is through stories. Yeah. So stories are fascinating. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, for one thing, it, it underscores the general point, really, really that um, we can self-generate uh, heartfelt experiences, which probably are tracked by underlying oxytocin-related processes, because so much, as you say, of the work of the imagination. We're hearing the words of a story, but the words are usually fairly schematic. We're constructing a whole internal world in our own minds, and then we're getting oxytocin responses to that. So it, it, you know, it, it reinforces the notion that there are things we can do ourselves to you know, incline the mind in a more loving direction. Um, if I could, and we, all, we have about 10, 12 minutes left, so let's be moving along here. Um, various people have pointed out uh, some of the dark side, if you will, of oxytocin-related processes. For example, if we're um, very vulnerable to a certain kind of story, uh, we could be very vulnerable to or taken in by people who are working, or who are pulling on our heartstrings, mm -hmm. and who are working our vulnerabilities uh, related to oxytocin. I've actually read recently that there are perfumes and aftershaves that are saturated with oxytocin in them that salespeople are now putting on to increase trust in their customers or their potential customers. So they're more likely to uh, buy the car or buy the house, what have you. Can so I if you go... That, uh, that's just wrong. So I should say... For yeah, so speak to all this if you could, the, including the honest, the genuine uh, yep. risks, if you will, of oxytocin. So oxytocin is a prescription drug. There are no perfumes. There are no... These are homeopathic things. So uh -huh. uh -huh. I've story. seen ads for them. Which means there's zero in it. So they please, took me in important. right there. They played on my heartstrings. Don't, don't buy uh, any of the stuff on the internet that claims to have oxytocin in it. Um, so you know, we've shown that touch releases oxytocin. So I say hugs, not drugs. So uh, you know, I have the nickname Dr. Love. So your prescription from Dr. Love is eight, eight hugs a day. Don't buy the junk on the internet. Did you say and eight hugs a day? Eight hugs a day. That, right, that means you're giving someone else the gift every hour. You're outside the house of releasing oxytocin. They'll generally reciprocate. Mm -hmm. And then you're starting this, vish, this virtuous cycle in which I'm caring for you, you're caring for me, we feel connected to each other, 
We showed recently, actually, just in the last month or so, we published a paper showing that oxytocin reduces cardiovascular stress and improves the immune system. So it, we're getting right, some of the benefits. Oxytocin improves, so it's, slow down. Oxytocin improves yeah. something, vascular stress. Could you unpack that? Uh, reduces cardiovascular stress. So yes. it reduces heart rate and stress hormones okay. and uh, also improves the immune system. So yeah. as we know, you know, social relationships are very protective against early death and uh, ill health. And this is one of the reasons why the safety signal says, hey, it's cool. Everything's fine. You're in community. You're embedded with the other humans who are safe. You can relax. And that's important. Um, so anyway, the thing on these uh, Internet uh, products um, claiming to have oxytocin is we published kind of three, kind of, you know, the sort of groundbreaking papers on oxytocin. We're all published in 2005. Lots of media attention and uh, this and that. And so inevitably, three months after these papers came out, you know, these products come on the Internet. And so... Um, Anyway, they're very expensive ethyl alcohol. So if you want to spend, you know, 40 bucks to buy um, rubbing alcohol, mm. that's what you're going to get. Okay, right. dark side. Um, so we've done many, many tests in which we, we uh, either have people's brains release their own oxytocin or give them, pharmacologically give them synthetic oxytocin. People are still cognitively intact. And, and so it's not like um, I have more oxytocin on board and therefore I'm, it's like I'm on ecstasy or something. I'm hugging everybody. No. I know what I'm doing. I just feel much more connected and relaxed and more empathic. So, um, you know, the, the brain's own oxytocin system is, is very good at modulating second by second uh, sort of appropriate social behaviors with, again, a bunch of other brain systems as well. So you're saying, so, in effect, that people could become, as it were, more warm-hearted while also remaining clear-headed. Correct. Very well put. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, exactly right. And having said that, if I'm feeling very connected to my group, and my group is about doing violence to others, um, oxytocin still is going to make me feel good to that, to my in-group, and I can still engage in out-group violence, as a, as a case in point. We did a study once on a rugby team. It turns out the majority of rugby players, before a match, released oxytocin. They also released a lot of testosterone and stress hormones. So they have in-group bonding to effectuate out-group aggression. Yeah. Right? So again, just because oxytocin released it doesn't mean I'm loving the whole world. It just means I'm connecting to at least a subset of people around me. But all these mechanisms are very conditional. There's no, you know, it takes us take us from zero to 100. It takes us from, you know, neutral to, you know, from 50 to 60 or something, release oxytocin. So know what I'm doing. So this is not a, a love drug. It's not a cure-all. It's just a big missing target that scientists didn't know about that tells us about the good behaviors, many of the good behaviors humans engage in. Um, we knew a lot about the bad behaviors. You know, it's easy to study fear and stress in the labs, but you know that having a, a target for understanding good behaviors and how we modulate that, that's what I think is kind of missing. You had one more good point, um, and now I've lost it. I'm sorry. Remind me of your excellent point that I've now forgotten. I got so excited to talk about, please don't buy the stuff on the Internet. Um, I did go on TV a couple of years ago in New York with one of the uh, spokesmodels from one of these companies, and... Uh, you know, they went off the market for two months, and now they're back on. So, yeah. um, there, you know, there is some evidence that uh, petting a dog will release oxytocin. Um, my lab hasn't been able to replicate that. We tried. Uh, but, ox but dogs are very good stress relievers, we've shown. And so relieving stress helps us connect to others as well. So, yeah. again, there's not one pathway here. There's a, there's a bunch of interesting yeah. kind of convergent pathways. And, and uh, I think for listeners, we need connection. And connection is, is often very uh, healing and stress-reducing. Yeah. And so if we work on building those connections, we're going to be healthier and happier for the most part. I think there are a lot of people, um, and you see them in distressed relationships, but also in general, who are concerned that if they open into love, as it were, and they, they let themselves become more warm-hearted, more compassionate, more generous, kinder, more empathic, if they let the other person's viewpoint uh, land more over here, etc., that if they do those things, they open themselves up to being taken advantage of or abused, especially if, as you say, when they were young, they were significant violations of trust, maybe not even necessarily catastrophic ones, as in sexual molestation, um, but still, they're, they're concerned about that. So appreciating that you can simultaneously become more compassionate, you can become kinder, uh, you can become uh, more understanding of other people while simultaneously taking care of yourself 
and preserving your own interests and standing up for your own needs and speaking truth to power and all the rest of that. That then paradoxically can let people become more open. You know, the old line, fences make for good neighbors. So the more secure you feel in the truth of your fences and your capacity to be strong on the other side of them, the more you can be relational with the person on the other side of the fence, as it were. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very good point, and you put it so eloquently. And I think that I'd just like to add one little thing if I can, that you know, there is this small proportion of the population, about 2%, who are psychopathic, and they tend to be very good at manipulating the oxytocin system. So mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll tell you about the science of that in a minute, but just as a sort of side note, mm -hmm. um, the reason I, I wanted to become a behavioral scientist was when I was 18 years old, I worked at a gas station, and I was conned out of $100, which I took out of the cash drawer. I didn't have 100 bucks. I was 18. And so, um, and, and you know, when you work at a gas station for a year, you observe at night, you observe, you know, all the humans and every <laughs> facet of their behaviors. And so anyway, this was a really classic con that got me, and uh, in many of these classic cons, and this is exactly what psychopaths do, it's not that the con works because the victim trusts the, the con man, it's the opposite. The con man shows he trusts the victim, right? I'm weak, I need your help, I don't know what to do, my car's broken down, oh, and I know you're a good person, you can help me, and boom, that induces in the receiver the oxytocin, and you want to reciprocate. Oh, this poor person needs my help. And normally mm -hmm. when people need our help, they really need our help, and our brain systems help us engage mm -hmm. in that. So again, this 2% of the population make up between 25 and 40% of the U.S. prison population, depending on how you measure psychopathology. Mm -hmm. So these individuals are dangerous. And so for the most part, 95% of people, the now hundreds of people we've measured, thousands of people, I'm sure, all around the globe, again, from, from the rainforest of Papua New Guinea to, uh, you know, every country I can get myself into, a positive social interaction will release oxytocin to 95% of these people, but 5% don't. So three of those 5% are the really stressed out, I just can't get it, I'm, you know, having a bad day. But the 2% are these psychopaths, and they're, they have very stable relationships, they don't sustain relationships long, they don't have dogs. Psychopaths don't have dogs. Because dogs are very needy, they need to be cared for, and they just they can't do that. Right. It's not about he's surviving. They so, torture dogs, but anyway, yeah. But yeah. yeah. And so, anyway, these individuals, you know, you need to avoid. And so even yeah. though they try to string you along, you know, it, I, as you said, you need to have this sort of secure base where you can say, yeah, it's not, there's th things I'm not going to do. I'm just, I, that's not yeah. comfortable for me, and I don't want to go there. And understanding what those boundaries are internally, gee, it takes a long time, doesn't it? I think it, uh, I think you've got to be probably either really great insight or maybe in your 30s before I think you really get a good view of that for most people I know, certainly for me. Um, it takes a while. And so um, anyway, I encourage people to go on that interesting journey. Yeah, I, I think that I don't actually know if it takes a long time to discern what's kind of happening with the other person. And I think there are a couple of very critical turning points in a relationship that are very revealing and, and that has to do with what does the other person do when you attempt to repair? Mm. Do they block your attempts to repair? Do they punish you for attempting to repair? Uh, when you talk about their part of the matter, even as you sincerely are willing to take responsibility of your own, do they throw, the, uh, throw it back in your face? Um, you know, I'm a nice guy and all the rest of that, but Trust but verify, right? And Absolutely. when you see someone, especially three strikes, you know, if you make three reasonably skillful, reasonably virtuous, you know, civil, uh, not grossly inflammatory efforts to sort of repair something with them, and they just blow off the repair process itself, uh, that's kind of a clue that probably the relationship, alas, needs to shrink to the size that it's safe. Uh, the, and that size may be really small. Right. Well, anyway, uh, moving to a wrap here, I want to ask you two final questions. If I, so, so Paul, uh, if you don't mind saying, uh, you're someone who obviously has done a lot of inner work. You've, you know, you've practiced what you've preached here in terms of relationships. Still, we all have a growing edge. Um, what's your growing edge these days in relationship? Uh, what are you working on, and how are you helping yourself in that regard? Uh, that's a great question. I really think I still struggle with taking another person's perspective. And it's just awfully hard, particularly for people that you're around all the time, your love, your spouse, to not be annoyed by the little things that kind of drive you nuts mm -hmm. and sort of see things from their perspective. Um, I have found that having a sense of 
humor is really valuable. Uh, just, you know, not taking things so seriously. Um, you know, so you forgot to crash out or didn't wash the dishes. It's really not the end of the world. And even though that personally drives me nuts because I really love neatness and perfection, um, I, I think working hard internally, working hard on this is not a big deal. Right? This is the person I love. This is the person I care about. Um, you know, letting things go. And, we, and for some reason, I think we let things go with our friends much more than with our family members. Yeah. Um, you know, like, our friends are like, oh. So, uh, you know, I think I'm sort of skeptical of having your spouse be your best friend, but kind of working on that, really seeing this person as a friend as well as a romantic partner and life partner. Um, mm. Anyway, so uh, we continue to do work on, um, on meditation as well. Uh, in fact, May 4th in Claremont, we are doing an experiment on mass meditation. So we're going to see if uh, 10 minutes of instruction and a couple hundred people together will have a uh, mass effect. So, you know, I'm a very cheap guy, you know, because I, you know, I was trained as an economist, and so uh, I always want to get the biggest bang for my buck. So I think, yeah. you know, we, we have a very wonderful uh, uh, meditation teacher who's going to come out. Don't need, everyone's donating their time. We, this, yeah. There's unfunded experiment. Yeah. So we're just going to see, and we're going to take some blood measurements and see what happens. So if people are in the Claremont area May 4th, they are welcome to come out and, uh, and participate and get some free training in, in uh, yeah. meditation. Now, I should say uh, May 4th, 2013 will be after, unfortunately, uh, when this series is, becomes available to people, especially archived. But going forward, um, as we move to a close here, uh, people can find out about you at Claremont and get involved in other very, very neat projects. Uh, one of the things I, I want to tell you, Paul, is as someone, I'm someone who you know, consumes a lot of research, uh, what you're doing is very creative. And um, it's an interesting word that arose for me about it. I mean it in a very good way. Your research is very aggressive. Uh, interestingly, that it's about oxytocin. It's creative. You're trying new things. You're going to Papua New Guinea. You're, you're, going, you're thinking about prison populations. I mean, you're doing very, very adventuresome, which maybe is even a better word for the kind of work you're doing. It's very impressive. So now I want to ask you my last question, okay? And um, if you don't mind adjusting your camera so your head's more in the middle of it, otherwise I feel like I'm somehow sitting on your toe, looking up at your head. There we go. I'm here. The whole fall. Okay, good. Fall in context. Anyway, well, to swing back, you said a very powerful and important thing, which is that oxytocin uh, really supports in-group bonding. It's great. In-group bonding is great in a lot of ways, including the way it helps our physical health, cardiovascular health, and all the rest of that. It makes us feel better, helps us take care of our children better, helps us be the village it takes to raise a child, etc. And in-group bonding can also facilitate out-group aggression, right? And so this goes to the question that I ask everyone, uh, sometimes in a little bit of a different form. So if you had your own personal magic wand, the Paul Zak wand, if you will, that could make a difference worldwide in terms in one fundamental way, uh, maybe with regard to this idea of using the power of oxytocin and perhaps other social capabilities of the brain to expand the circle of us, of in-group, to include the whole wide world. Uh, if there were a simple practice that people could do routinely, taking a few minutes or less every day, that you could get a critical mass of human brains to do every day, a billion brains a day, if you will, uh, what would be that one practice that you think could draw upon what we know about oxytocin and could help expand uh, the sense of in-group uh, to include the whole wide world? Well, thanks for giving me, uh, saving the easy question for last. <laughs> um, you know, I gave a talk recently about acceptance. And acceptance is, a, is, I think, a very powerful word. I mean, it's different than tolerance. Tolerance means, you know, I'm okay with you. Acceptance means, uh, you know, you're, you're part of me. And I think there are a variety of ways we can be more accepting of people who seem to be different than us. Um, it's very difficult to study neuroscience and not uh, generate a notion of acceptance for others. The, the, the human brain although very, very similar across individuals, is also quite varied in the way it reacts to different environments. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the ways we inhibit the oxytocin system is by not essentially listening to these 
ancient impulses to connect. So having this dialogue in our head, being super busy. So I think just slowing down and mm -hmm. how people do that is up to them. But, you know, perhaps taking 15 or 20 minutes a day just for yourself, just to, to mm -hmm. reduce the thoughts. It could be through meditation. It could be through prayer. It could be by taking a walk quietly. But, you know, take out the earbuds and just spend time with yourself. So yeah. reflect a little bit on that. And we do find that individuals who can take that reflection time are more accepting. So um, do yourself and the people around you the honor of taking time to accept others. Mm. That's great. And what's also beautiful is that that's within our power. Uh, we can do that ourselves, even as we may not accept their behavior toward us. We may take action about it, perhaps, but we can still work on um, seeing, their su seeing their suffering and accepting them, too. Right. Well, uh, wrapping up here, again, I want to uh, encourage people to take a look at your book, The Moral Molecule, as well as your work. Uh, they can find you online. They can see your TED Talks, and uh, they can learn more about you down there at Claremont and so forth and Loma Linda. Uh, I know you've got an experiment to get back to fairly soon in your blue scrubs. Uh, you've really been a delight to speak with, uh, Paul. And I'm very uh, glad you were as open and you were very, very open in this call. Uh, and I really appreciate that. What a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, great. All right, take care and welcome everybody uh, who's uh, seen this show or this hour here. And greetings and glad you were with us. And uh, check out uh, other uh, episodes, as it were, of this series on The Loving Brain. Take care till next time. Mm -hmm.